and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Well, brothers, they're the double-headed monster behind behind Danes of Astoria, and a, bu and a bunch of filthy weebs just like the rest of us here. We have Good Brother Zen and Good Brother L90 of Dead Tree Studios. How are you guys doing today? It's great to be back. Mm -hmm. it's, good to ha it's good to have you guys back in the temple, and thank, thank you for putting up with all of my shenanigans. Thanks for having us. I'm happy to be here. Mm -hmm. So... I do I do appreciate that you get that you were you guys were willing to send me the demo P, the demo PDF. Um this means that for this particular interview I won't be flying as blind as I was the last time I had you guys on. Yeah, and we figured it'd be probably better cuz the last time we mm, days that story kind of got overshadowed by our previous project follow that question oh, by it and you know, it just happens. Mhm. Mm um and inc incidentally I missed a golden opportunity to a to ask about something. Oh. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if I brought it up last time, but has anyone brought up to you ga games like Iron Claw and Jade Claw? Uh yes. I kind of figured someone what someone would have you, you know because of the whole demi human thing. Yeah, and also when I was researching for uh, Dangerous Astoria, uh. I was trying to look at like, okay, who else has you know, you know, Monster Girl RPGs, and I really only found two. Yeah. And obviously the um, Iron Claw, and it's not really Monster Girl, but it's in the category people might associate it with. Mm -hmm. Which a lot of, one would one would think that a lot of people would make furry jokes about about Iron Claw, but because of how good it is, it manages to get away from that. Exactly. Um, but with but with that in with that in mind, now as I as I understand it, you guys are using a D, you guys are using a D10 system, one that is success based. If I've got if I've got this correct, yes, sir. Yeah, that is correct. So since it since it's about um, rolling a set of D10s based on based. Primarily, ba primarily based on a primarily ba based on attribute and skill. I am cu I am curious if I'm curious if the if the way you have it is that um, difficulty and difficulty modifiers are go are going to aren't going to add more or less dice, but are going to change the baseline die that's considered a success. You want to take a second? Yep, yeah, sorry, give me a second. I'm on push to talk, so I usually say things and I gotta realize that I'm on push to talk. Um, so, it currently, yeah, what we're doing with our modifier is it is plus or minus, uh, as you read, it is plus or minus uh, die um, because the what is your success for rolling, a lot of that is... Kind of up to the GM for what you want. We have some basic, you know, guidelines for this is what we think is uh, fair. This is what plays as fair during playtesting. Um, and if you're new to the game, you don't know what you're doing. Um, follow these guidelines for these level areas. Uh, but uh, yeah, if Zen's sitting there going, "Hey, I want to steal all the gold from uh, this dragon, and I'm wearing a bright neon suit." I, as the GM, can say, great, that's going to take you 10 tens, roll them. Mm -hmm. um, and I can decide, since this is a super hard one, negate three or six dice, or however many it was, I think it's six dice, negate six dice to my dice pool, and I'm going, great, I've got three dice. Uh, great, I hope you roll a lot of tens and get a lot of crit successes, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Now, one thing... One 
One thing that I definitely found interesting when it came to how you guys are going to be handling combat is the fact that you're using an AP, a, um, AP system. Love AP systems. We'll die for it. Um, what what prompted what prompted going with that instead instead of a instead of a setup instead of a hierarchy of actions, for instance. First is a primary experience that we already have from you know coming from Fallout, um, and we always found that uh, having an a pool of actions mm -hmm. uh, makes for greater not only fun but options for the players. Mm -hmm. So that way, when because uh, me personally, I dislike uh, D and D's, you know. How they, you know, how the action economy works. Most mm -hmm. because you can wait your whole turn, depending on how much, you know, whatever that is. And if you say cast a spell or attack slash move, that's it. <laughs> and you're like, oh well, I just spent what my fun was, and then you have to wait till next turn. So in this way, at very least, at minimum, you get multiple tries to for an attack, especially at lower levels, or you can pick up an item, run this way, attack, you know, any combination of what you need to do at the time to help you, you know, move along to the next section. So I always found it was best. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I'm guessing one of the other reasons you guys did that it is to allow allow for some differentiation between um, between I, between, wep between weapons, you know, heavier weapons taking up more AP. Yeah, we have a few of those that have a higher AP cost from there because they get a higher tier, do more damage. So you don't want, want them at lower levels to have that, uh, as opposed to like the higher level characters, mm -hmm. you know. And when it comes to AP, is it is it something that's going to be fairly somebody's AP pool going to be fairly static, or is or would there be a bit of a gap between where someone's AP pool is at the start and where it might be um, at high levels? Oh, definitely. Uh, at level one, each character has free AP, just point blank period, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and you actually gain AP the more you level. So it's kind of like a video game in that sense. So every level, by the time you get to level 10, you have 12. Yeah. Now, I did notice that you guys have qu have um, quite a few skill, quite a few um, skills, as well as t as well as talents and skill perks. But I specifically want to focus on the skills part. Um, an issue that ends up happening with a lot of games that have a skill-based system, and I pick on Shadowrun a lot because it's a prime offender of this sort of thing, but how do you manage the issue of analysis paralysis since you're only going to have so many skill points? Yep. Uh, Alan, I'm just, um, sure, do you want to take this one now? It doesn't totally matter to me. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, you can take it if you want. I know right, you were you were a lot more into that system than I was. Yep. All right. So uh, first of all, most we give you five skill points every level. You know, no matter what. Mm -hmm. So you definitely will have a cap on your skills. However, I did uh, math it out that if you wanted to be a jack of all trades, you can get a decent skills and everything, right? And if you want to max out like just certain skills, you will be a master of like half the board or whatever, mm -hmm. or enough to at least if you had a uh, party of four, everyone can be specialized in something uh, that will equal the whole skill, uh, the whole skill list. Uh, what also helps uh, makes that decision is that uh, we've given each skill uh, free perks that you can unlock mm -hmm. uh, by the time you get to their maximum. So, oh, and skills go from one to ten. So, yeah. for the listeners out there, um, so at different thresholds, you'll gain an ability from it. So you can see, oh. Uh, uh, for example, a uh, skull with unarmed real fast. Like, oh, unarmed. Uh, I can, if I don't want to be a true master of it, you know, for the damage or whatever benefits I get from it, uh, you could get your abilities from it. Mm -hmm. uh, which, for like, say, unarmed is like at three points is knockout, which adds to your stun damage with fists. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you just want that and want to say, okay, I don't really need this anymore go to something else that that little buffer can say can help you choose like your threshold of what you want to put into it mm -hmm. the if 
uh, I can jump into. The, the other two things, too, that kind of help with sk uh, skill paralysis and what do I pick and how do I pick it is um, two other big things. Um, um, one, disciplines, so the class-based system, have skill requirements. If you want to be X, uh, you know, you want to be X or Y, you need to have a certain amount in these different skills or this skill typing. Um, if you want to be this discipline or that discipline, pick up these different classes. Um, and then the other thing is too is especially for combat-based ca uh, class or skills, goodness words, um, you know, unarmed ranged weapons. Uh, putting points into a skill does not affect your ability to hit someone and land an attack. It mm -hmm. increases the amount of base damage you do. So someone with a unarmed in one is still not not putting out as much damage out in someone uh, as someone with this, uh, an unarmed of ten, but they're not sitting there going, "Well, I'm completely useless in the skill, and I can't fight with this." Um, my character is just kind of bubkiss. Maybe I should have done points and I'm not. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Now, when speaking of that, one thing I noticed when it comes to when it came to, when it came to the weapon is is that you were separating a lot of them by tiers. Um, yes. Is the, is that some is that something that's tied into how you handle skills? I don't really know. Um, tiers is kind of a throwback from Fallout Equestria because there's a lot from that system that we just we either keep using um, because we like it or keep using it because we use it. And it's at this point in this game, it is nothing more than a nice little denominatory marker for you as the GM to kind of be able to classify weapons based off of, you know, early, middle, late, end game type theory. Um, and you know, is this are these are these weapons or are these items a little bit more suitable for my party? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even though and having them at let's say you take the level of tier four item like a hammer or whatever. And give it to your level ones, if they can use it uh, for the AP cost, because it might be more AP cost. They can use it, sure. They get a lot of damage, but they can only attack once <laughs> and nothing else. Um, so it's things like that. So it's you know, like the L9 said, uh, it will. It's a good measure of okay, if I want to do tier fours, that's more like level sevens, eights, nines to give it to them than the mm -hmm. level ones. Yeah. And. Because the other thing, because the, th the thing I was curious about is is if um, is if there's certain perks like being able to, like like equipping we equipping weapons at certain tiers, and I'm just using perks in a general sense, not specifically for um, skill per for the whole thing with skill perks. Gotcha. But uh, currently, uh, no, there's no restriction on using them besides uh, the hit to your AP. Mm-hmm. Now, incident incidentally, something I will something I did find amusing is <clears throat> the is the fact that is the fact that um skills not skills but um things like shields are treated as weapons, which is something I think more game designers should do. If I'm being honest, listen, I was hit with a shield. I don't care what you say. Then how does the grass taste, little man? <laughs> I'm just mm. I'm just saying you it tastes like iron and copper. <laughs> I'm just saying you've prob you've probably seen just as much as I have of of cases where shields are only used as a defense boost and nothing else. Oh yeah, and uh, unless they can be you know mod to have like a spike or something to give you an attack for it, but more or less yes, they they've only been a boost to your defense. Because apparently no apparently nobody looked at those big ass Spartan shields. They never tell you the second reason they had those big ass Spartan shields. <laughs> Was to beat the enemies. Well, yeah, well, yeah. The it's you have you're essentially putting out you're essentially putting on a, a slab of solid bronze. I mean, my favorite is that no one ever considers the pavis, which is a spike steel. Uh. The spike isn't in the front; it's the shape of it. So it pretty much becomes a spiked gauntlet if, the way you wear it, mm -hmm. and it's a shield. So you know, through you. But don't screw me. 
Yeah, and I've, I'm um, I'm given given my heritage, I'm more I'm plenty familiar with the with um with the effectiveness of a Tarj. Which, if you're not familiar, is the is the small sh is the small shield with a with that nasty looking spike. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And, and we have a few, few few types of shields. We got yeah. uh, shields to throw. We got the spikes for us. You know, all of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, because we based all of our stuff on actual weapons in real life. Yeah, and plenty plenty of game plenty of game designers do that, but a lot of a lot of game designers, in my opinion, fall into this fall into a particular trap of not of not not ma not making um not go not going with a lot of variety when it comes to when it comes to weaponry. Um, and I remember I remember John Wick claiming that uh, that weapon lists are an outdated concept because if it, if the stats are going to be that similar, what's the difference between a What's the difference between a lo a um a lo a long sword or a ba or a bastard sword or an or an a or an axe? And I know I know that Warhammer has a lot of those just co just codified into hand weapon, but anybody who know anybody who knows how swords work knows that there's a lot of difference. You know, I kind of agree with it, only because again, when I was playing D and D. I look at the damage, I look at everything else, if I was like, I don't really get anything different from here, so, you know, I guess just what I like, and I just can go for the whole game with one weapon. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, one thing that, one thing that I did notice is you, you guys are do, you guys are doing a skill-based approach, but you're, instead of classes, you're doing sets of disciplines. Yes. Yes. Early on, had you get er, was this was it something that you guys decided on early on, or was it a case where you initially were going to do full, um, full cla full classes, in the traditional sense, but it just but evolved out of it. Can can I take this one? Go ahead. Okay, so this was the thing when we started doing a lot of the, the pre work and started planning this game is we sat down and we went, well, fuck classes. Um, pardon my French. Because um, while well, classes can be kind of cool if done right, um, I, I've always found them extremely limiting to you're playing a certain archetype. And one of the things that really attracted us and really that we really enjoyed about like Fallout Equestria, because that's um, a thing that really shaped our, our, a lot of our view on game design, was how free you were to do whatever the heck you wanted. Um, because it was completely classes, uh, classes, classless. It was always <laughs> level perk. It was always level perk and character based trait orientated, and you could mix and match between the two thousand some odd perks and traits available and create everything and anything you wanted to fit whatever you wanted. And we wanted something similar like that. Um, so we figured we would do. Something not that skill perk. We didn't want to reskin the Fallout of Equestria system because we wanted to step away from that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but we we knew we wanted something kind of open, and we were thinking of doing this flowchart design, um, where like you kind of like a video game. You know, uh, I want to you know level up kind of perk ability. Of, I guess almost like Borderlands and how they do things. Skill tree. Yeah, skill tree. We kind of wanted like some skill tree as tree class system that was open and mostly based off of what you picked before, what you're going into, what you're planning on, and what your base uh, skills are. And, and to be fair, to be fair, the tree that you're thinking of that Borderlands does, there's a time on a tradition of doing that with a. I'd say a, I'd say a majority of ARPGs. Basically, any anything tr anything trying to rip off Diablo two probably has some version of a skill tree. Yeah, yeah. Um, skill tree. I'm just trying to find a way to describe it because words aren't my forte. I uh, even though I teach for a living and I'm tired from teaching all day, so I'm just trying to find words. That's all it is currently. But yeah, we wanted some open. We we like we we like some things about classes, but we wanted an open class system that wasn't as restrictive as your traditional tabletop RPG class system. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and you weren't locked into a set of, you know, a small set of archetypes. So if I wanted to be a necromancer and a cleric at the same time, I could not be a death cleric, but actually be like a light cleric and a, uh, a death necromancer wizard mm-hmm. um, and, and do something like that, if that makes sense. Yeah. And the other thing that I noticed is if I'm not if I'm reading this correctly, um, each discipline comes with a set of abilities right out of the gate. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Um, I'm, guess, I'm guessing the so es- essentially when you're getting a discipline, you're getting a package. Yes, you're getting a package of abilities whether they're passive or active, combat or otherwise. Um, and then you usually get some form of passive buff, like permanent passive buff, like a buff to one of your attributes, or um, access to new spells or whatever. Yeah, as long as long as you meet the requirements, of course. Yes. Um, given, given that, whenever it comes to prerequisites with these sort of things and the idea of qualifying into things... Um, I'm always reminded of my of my time with, say, D and D third edition or Pathfinder, with some of the ridiculous feat requirements. And I'm guessing you guys have made have made sure to not go that far with um, prerequisites for disciplines. Yeah. Hey, yo, yo. Sorry, you want to go? Yeah, I was about to just say, uh, is it, we all we have for requirements are uh, the skills uh, you probably need and the attributes you probably need. And that's it. You don't have to get anything real truly special to get these. Oh, and uh, apply a prerequisite class that you chose when you started out. That's basically it. Yeah, some 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 disciplines will say that you need to have a certain discipline before it. Like, if you wanted to be, like, a Mystic Knight, I think you need to be a warrior before you become a Mystic Knight. Um, and there's a couple other, like, you know, sword spell or whatever, where you, mm-hmm. you might need a class. It doesn't say you need a specific class, but you need the ability or you need a system of those. So you could be any magic casting class and then uh, transfer over into this uh, class. And we tried to keep things relatively simple. I don't think there's any attribute over 8 that's required. Um, and I don't think there's any skill, well, no skill past 10 that's required. We don't usually require more than 2, two skill um, or 3 skills at a certain level per mm. discipline. So it's it's not if you if you don't plan well, you might find yourself you back yourself into a corner. But if you look at your you plan it, and you look at it, and you you know you do the the, the custom, custom ARPG thing, and look at everything, you know math all all the heck. It's it's pretty easy to get into just about anything. Yeah. Um. Of course this this also an, this also answers one question I w- I was going to have with this, and that is how easy or difficult it is to gish, and it. From what I'm seeing out of this, it looks like it's fairly easy. And just so for clarification, you said Gesh, right? Gish. G-I-S-H. I have no idea what that term is. Gish. I'll process it. Gish is is a term a term for characters or or and or character builds that. Can that can, that can fight that can fight and cast reasonably well? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, there are a couple uh, disciplines dedicated to that spell mm-hmm. sword. One of them. Yeah. Um. For for what it's worth, when it comes to the when it comes to the idea of excessive prerequisites in in D and D or Pathfinder, my go to example is Whirlwind Attack. Yeah. <laughs> oh, simply because of the amount of st- the amount of stuff you have to get in order. Do you recall what do you recall what you needed to get in order to do whirlwind attack? Your soul needs to be sold, <laughs> and um, yeah, you have to give away a couple firstborns, lost a finger, died and been resurrected at least once, and um, uh, been dishonored by. Two gods, but favored by another six. Don't forget to pay your taxes. Oh yes, <laughs> that too. 
I said I said whirlwind attack, not set up not set up a rocket in Aurora 4X. <laughs> uh, but what's the difference though? For whirlwind attack, this is what you needed: combat expertise, dodge, mobility, spring attack, a dex and intelligence of 13, and a BAB of four. Again, I see no difference. And that's like four fe four feats, two two um two reasonably sized um ability scores. And as an aside, two ability scores that if you're pl if you're playing fi if you're playing fighter, you may not even prioritize. And that's just to that's just to be able to do a a, a um the same the same spinning attack that everybody sees in every Legend of Zelda game besides the first one and the second one. To be fair, I think L nines was easier to get because that's mostly RP based. <laughs> Uh, and one now one of the things I noticed when I looked through the disciplines is some of them have a set cost and some of them have a have a um, modifier cost. Is it a case where you with with the latter where you'd activate that at the cost of spending more AP than you would normally? Yes. Yeah. yeah so if you know you have X, uh, I don't know. Um, Double attack, and it's a plus one, so you do your normal attack, but you pay an extra one AP. So if your your attack was three AP, you're now paying four AP, and you get the benefits of the ability. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, when it comes one one thing I did find kind of interesting is the um, spell list. Especially, especially since there is a whole lot, there's a whole lot more spell categories than what than what I think people would expect. Um, given some of your previous experiences, I'm guessing you guys have um, tr have tried to rain spells in so that you don't have um, quadratic wizards. We do. We have rained in them a, a bit. Yes. <laughs> um. So with that in mind, how would how I. I know I know that you have a skill for using spells, but when it comes to learning spells, would that be through disciplines or would or would it be through something else? Disciplines is the the easiest and probably the main way to get it if you're you're looking to go for it like that because mm -hmm. you, it's basically your you choose upon level up. You know, yeah. you get that you choose that they give you the the passive. Let's say for uh, spell sword, they give you like or imbuing spells. You get like uh, your versatility amount of imbuing spells. Mm -hmm. uh, what, by the way, versatility is a stat for magic that that magic casters have. Yeah. Um. And that's the easiest way. Uh, and then you can you know choose a, a talent we have to learn more spells. You can do it like that. Mm -hmm. And anything beyond that is RP based. Yeah. Like you find a wizard in the woods, you find a grimoire on the ground, yada yada. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and we do have hard set rules for learning magic from a grim grimoire or learning magic from a magic teacher. So you can learn it that way through RP and skill rolls. Um, but yeah, the easiest way is just pick a discipline that gives you more spells. Mm -hmm. Now, when it com when it comes to spell casting. I can in, I can infer that it is it is a skill role like any like any other skill role but in terms of in terms of the actual casting is it a just is it just a case of um rolling against the difficulty and then and and then and spending mana points or do you have are there are there some monkey wrenches into the mix that you guys have So uh magic in combat like any other attack roll where you roll the d100, you have to land outside of your target's dodge chance to actually hit them. Um, and then uh, you spend mana points. Outside of combat, yeah, it would be a skill roll where you roll your arcana, because it's driven by your arcana outside of combat, um, and then spend the appropriate mana. There aren't really any major monkey wrenches thrown into it otherwise. Um, you know, unless your GM's being mean and you're, I don't know, trying to cast uh, a water spell in the lava field. Because mm -hmm. 
Now, one of one thing that I, when I was looking through the character sheet that I found interesting is um is ha is having block chance. So, and ov obviously that obviously that'd be for things like shields and fighting defensively. How would that work? So the way block chance work is yeah that is primarily having shields that's that is a stat unique to shields. Mm -hmm. um, block chance is it's a passive chance that's added to your dodge chance. Um, I want I want to say it's equal to your dodge chance. I'd have to look up the rule again. Um, but uh, for example, if you have a dodge chance of twenty and you have a shield, um, you would add your block chance to your dodge chance. So now you have a essentially an effective DC of forty. Um, if I attack you and I roll between one and twenty, that's a normal miss. That's in your regular dodge chance range. So you just you miss. I miss completely, and you don't take any damage. But if I roll in between that extra dodge chance, that extra twenty you got from your shield, um, you you apply the DT the the damage threshold of your shield. Now, if you decide to, and that's your passive block. If you decide to actively block, your dodge chance becomes 100% because you're actively blocking. However, we treat it much like parry in terms of uh, spending reactionary AP um, per opponent attacking you. Yeah. Now, with the, with that in mind, I want to talk a bit on on crit on criticals and botches, or critical successes and critical failures. So. I do. I, if I've got this right, the key thing is is when you're rolling ones and tens. But in but since critical success and critical failure are a specific thing on the character sheet, how was how does that work out? So, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, long story short, when you're doing skill rolls out of combat, that's your ones and tens, and they modify your roll so tens explode and ones subtract successes. Um, meaning, you know, if I rolled a one and I had three successes, I now have two successes, right? Um, in combat, you have an actual critical success, critical, uh, fail chance. And that's based off the D100 roll you're rolling to attack. Um, so if you land within your critical attack, uh, uh, your critical attack threshold, let's say 95 to 100, uh, congratulations, it's a hit. And you do an extra 1d20 damage unless your spell or ability has any modifiers to that. Mm -hmm. And then if you crit fail, you failed spectacularly. What does the GM decide to torture you with? And that brings me to to something to something I am a bit curious about. Um, even though you guys are using a d10 pool, what prompted the idea of using a percentile system for combat? Then, yep. All right. So the percentile system for the combat situations. So, like I said, originally we came from Fallout, which also has a D100 system for its well everything, not just mm -hmm. combat. And we was looking for a way to streamline that a little bit. And I found that having it this way, that way, uh, um, all your skills, you know, skills abilities, uh, being used by the single D100 roll. All you have to do would be to roll it against their opponent's dot chance, mm -hmm. and you know that will act as per AC or whatever in other systems, uh, with uh, cutting down most of the fat with uh, combat and other systems. Uh, so that way you don't have to worry about uh, the, all that stuff, other stuff that uh, came for your character sheet. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Just roll that. And then we can move on to the next guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when we were play testing the very, very early, like pre, pre, pre alpha, uh, where all we had was like basic combat rolls and some things stolen from other games as a placeholder, um, we found combat was just super confusing, way drawn out. It, just, it was not fun to fight things with the the D10 system that we had. Yeah. And I think one thing that threw me off for a second is I'm so used to um, D1 to D100 systems being aim low, but it looks like in your case you guys are going with aim high. 
<laughs> Originally, we had aim low as well. We tried it out. Got kind of confusing how we was doing it with everything else, so we switched around the aim high. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I will always be an advocate for keep for keeping the targets consistent, um, and that comes from the aim low, aim high discrepancies that I would put up with in AD and D, for instance, where you want where um things. You're roll. You're rolling. You're rolling low to hit, but you're rolling high for damage, and you're also rolling low for, um, sk for skill percentage. Yeah, that's kind of how we have a Fallout question. Mm -hmm. And uh, additionally, when we were doing these things, uh, what helps uh, is that we don't have the massive um, bonus bloat that we had with our previous game. And I guess I, if we're going to bring D and D into this, we'll have the. Uh, modifiers to hit attack that will go above someone's AC to like ungodly degrees. Uh, mm -hmm. So that way it keeps everything in that 100 range and you don't have to, like I said, don't have to worry about anything else after that. Yeah. Now, with the, with that in with that in mind, uh, I did, I do recall the one thing that I'm one thing that I'm a bit curious about is on the sheet you got you guys have both talents but it, but in the book you also there was also the mention of boon. Um where do you guys where did you guys divide the line between what would count as a talent and what would be better served as a boon? All right, so the talents were are traditional feats, perks, uh special things you get on power level, up, you know, standard the boons was actually came about that day of trying to get some cohesion between the party. It's not everyone's building their own uh, uh, massive, I don't know, whatever as such today, right? Uh, so the boons are actually once you uh, the party gets it. So even though that says level three for a par uh, a person, technically it's for the party, right? So everyone would vote on which boon they get, and we'll have a list of those, you know, later. Mm -hmm. So. You can choose at level three, like you get like uh you now your party now owns like a uh, a small a dinghy. You can all, all use uh, a small fan club, you know, uh, during fans, something like mm -hmm. that. Just something to show that hey, as a party, we've all chosen this to help the party in further endeavors. Mm -hmm. And and you get a boon at uh I believe level three seven and nine, I believe if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, just add little things that help the party, you know be a party, you know, be together as a group, a unit. Yeah. Now, one particular kind of build that a lot of traditional games um, str um, struggle with, even even ones where you supposedly can do just about any kind of build, is the idea of somebody pl somebody playing up being a, a fencer adjacent. You know, a, li a light weapon, no a light weapon, no shield, li light armor, usually... Usually, some sort of weapon for poking. If you've played, if you've played against Raphael Mains and Soul Calibur, you know the pain. <laughs> One, yes. Two, loves up Raphael. Uh, three, I believe we do. Uh, we even have a duelist uh, discipline in there somewhere. Yeah, the duelist discipline, if I remember correctly, was inspired by Zoro, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, we we definitely have uh, those type of things because we, like I said, we have the discipline system, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also have more a free form class structure, and not class structure and uh, weapon structure as well. So even if you're so uh, in this case, uh, uh, the duelist, the the pokey with a you know rap rapier stick, it can be anything really that you use, uh, as long as this fits the same type of you know. Uh, categories as the rapier would be, like say, duelist. You have one-handed blades, you know. We and we have one-handed blades in spades, so you can use any of that for blades, rapier, swords. And at that point, you just choose what you want to like base your uh, duelist upon. Um, you could be a duelist that takes, you know, the gladi gladius and become like a gladi gladi gladiator duelist, you know, something like that. Um, and that's how we usually deal with. Uh, different archetypes and classes that people make up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and if you're talking about uh, to you know be the super dodgy high dodge chance, for the hit, you know, high dex pokey character with insanely high AC and like oh, 
um, there are perks and disciplines that can help increase your uh, your dodge chance as well, which can help further that particular build you're going for or the desirable build in your play, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, get, obviously, given the whole demi-human thing, there's a whole lot of variety that can, that can occur within that. Which also adds to it, yes. Uh, from what our game tests have <laughs> have shown, we have had uh, Stella Warriors as Beatles, uh, male carrion of Roadrunners, mm -hmm. uh, ma <laughs> Mage Moth Girls. They eat tents. Um, we've had a we've had a lot. Um, Someone made a Xenomorph. Someone made a Xenomorph. Yeah. This. Is this a bad is this a bad time to bring up that the that um uh, that the Z, that the xenomorph is technically a Disney princess? Oh yeah, they <laughs> bought it. Oh. <laughs> um. I mean, no, no, actually, the xenomorph queen is evil, so you know, that's 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 lining up with the the tradition. Mhm. Mm so, uh, yeah, like there's a lot where you can go, and I. If you gave me a very specific build or a very set of stringent guidelines, there's a really good chance I can build it. Um, but you know, you've got to read through the whole book. Yeah, I had uh, Shock Girl Berserkers. Uh, my my personal favorite is the one I made. Was obviously was the uh, the Bee Princess Monk. That was great. Yeah, I've got a Wily Coyote um, esque character going on who's an artificer. Um yeah. chasing down that male carrying a roadrunner. It's it, it's a fun time. Mm -hmm. The the thing with the that br that brings me to the trait system. I'm guessing I'm guessing that the that um the demi fa your choice of demi family and subtype will determine the traits that you have available and how many for each um each body part. It, um so we left it with a kind of segmented point by system. So each each segment, so head, arms, torso, legs, uh miscellaneous has eight points to spend. Um what demi family you have, so animal, insect, um, avian, aquatic, um, reptile, will limit some of your choices. Uh, you know, for example, like insects get a specific set of wings, they have a specific wing trait they can take, where avians have a different specific wing trait they take. They work slightly differently, um, but the, the avian wing traits open to mammals. Um, you know, there are certain perks that are open to all four or all five demi fauna traits. So, yeah, your family d will dictate what's what some certain uh, traits you can take, but it doesn't limit what you can have point wise in each section. Mm -hmm. And if you wow. spend eight points on one point traits in each section and have eight traits in each section, that is a thing you can do. But I'm I'm guessing I'm guessing that you guys aren't doing the aren't doing some aren't doing some sort of positive negative trait thing to i.e. um min maxing. There we do have negative traits. There are indeed negative traits which will refund you points. Is some if you want to be a blind girl with super hearing, you can do it. Okay, we okay, we get it. You read Daredevil. Yeah. That wasn't even where I was going, but I was kind of thinking of a oh shit. That You're is a daredevil character. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, I mean, people min max. We don't even fight it really much anymore. Uh, but we found that uh, if you give them the choice to make, quote unquote. A, the certain monster girl they want, they will try and be in lines with their own headcanon for it. So, it's only as OP as 
<laughs> we can allow it really um so if uh, they they probably hit more blocks trying to uh min max everything than they would probably like uh i guess the one example of that would be uh uh l9 how many people have wanted to have uh bird wings on their back everyone they everyone. need to die <laughs> um i these uh... have bird arms this is not Harvey Birdman law, attorney at law. You want actually, actually, you want you want to know you want to know the solution. If somebody wants wings, give them, give them Kane's wings. Listen, you know, have <laughs> so it. If they want wings on their back and the ability to fly and use their wings at the same time, they need to be insects. And spend the four points, the four plus points. On no, I'm, I'm, si I'm saying they can have wings, but all they can do is glide. They can't fly. Oh, you can do that too. Um, it's called gliding fins, mm -hmm. and that's open to a lot of people. Or, you know, you know, give, you know, give them that, but give, but make sure there's a monkey's paw attached. Yes. Now, mind you, we do lay out the rules of what we, you know, would like them to do. But once they have the book, they can do whatever they want, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but as of currently, we only have <clears throat> arm wings for you know everything but the insects, uh, mainly because we're saving the wings on back for like our later expansions of angels and devils and stuff like that. I uh, I can the get that. Um, especially especially since I th I remember I remember the book hinting at the con at the concept of um de of destinies for characters of higher levels. Yes, because as, as of right now, uh, those of you who don't know, the listeners at home, uh, we only go to level 10, uh, soft cap. And if you want to go past that, uh, then that will be like your, your mythic levels in Pathfinder, right? Because uh, at that point, you're now, uh, you're no longer getting uh, disciplines. You're now dedicating yourself to something. Mm -hmm. Whether it be Archmage, the true hero, yada, yada, yada. This is now you. This is who people know you as, you know, because you're just that legendary. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, I'd like to go, I'd like to go a little bit into the um the setting. Now, I can I I can infer that you're I can infer that you're going with with a um leaning towards. Towards high, towards high fantasy, but but when it comes to when it comes to te when it comes to tech levels, are we are we are we high medieval or are we lean are we leaning into early Renaissance? Want to take this on now? Uh, is kind of my answer, and we're we're kind of yeah, we're kind of probably at the end of. High medieval starting to get into early Renaissance. Currently, the idea is, uh, you know, high medieval with lots of Roman influence, um, and with later expansions and later adventure paths, um, that will eventually lead to uh, some big, 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 big world events, which will radically change how people view technology and magic, really leading to a magic tech boom. Um, and, you know, this is way off into the future, uh, which is why if you look at some of the way we do metals and enchanting and magic, like, there's a very specific reason for that. And yeah, that's what for that. We planned it out for that. Like, I, I spent days doing magic metal energy. It was fun, man. Yeah. So, yeah, high medieval may be starting to get into Renaissance. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, it, with that in mind, um, I guess, I guess one of, the, I guess one of the key, one of the key things is how, how, t how tamed is the wilderness? Is it a case where you have a lot of people in, in, um, in, t in towns and villages and a, and a whole lot of unexplored or un or untamed wilderness? I'm glad you asked. So, uh, the background background of the setting is uh, Zacharias the God, ruled over all, yada yada yada. Mm -hmm. Big war, he's gone. Uh, sealed inside of a mountain. When that happened, 
everything he made got flipped upside down. The curse upon the demi humans got placed. Uh, now everything that's not human can only be born female. The magical radiation, quote unquote, has spread throughout the land, fusing animals and you know plants together, making chimeras. So there's no original creatures around. They're all chimeric in some way. And when the war happened that you know sealed the, uh, the gods Aquarius, uh, it was godly, apocalyptic on a, a scale many would never see again. It shaped the land as we know now. Mm -hmm. The main draw, the quote unquote adventurers guild, which the uh, at base the players are a part of, uh, unless they change it to some like, hey, we're like knights or something. Mm -hmm. uh, they used to be called the cartographers guild, and the cartographers guild's job, back before they became the adventurers guild, was to uh, chart the land that just got flipped over like a pancake. <laughs> And had to deal with all the new creatures. So anything they had from before. Any knowledge, any pathways, all that, gone. So they had to start fresh. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where they got had to get so many people, you know, helping them out. What you know, hence mercenaries or people like who got nothing else to do, nothing for to lose, they, you know, renamed to Adventurers Guild. And as of now, uh, the humans who had most of their strength still left have the actual uh, great walled cities because they would stay out of the war at, at behest of their god. So they have civilization mm -hmm. as much as you can anyway. And all their lands that they control, they have some, some manner of peace, some tame chimera here and there. Everywhere else, if you didn't band together to make you know either a semblance of a uh, civilization, it's got retaken. So when you're going out, uh, you gotta be real careful because if you move outside the quote unquote the human human lands, and any lands that might be too uh, broken, uh, you're going to run into some manner of monster mm -hmm. that you probably won't even recognize. Oh, uh, that, uh, that's, uh, not, that's not including the uh, chimera down intelligent, but oh yeah, there are a lot of intelligent chimera too. But and then and that's also not uh, not necessarily. Um, fully explaining, because even in the human kingdom of Astoria, like, there are a lot of, they're not necessarily uncharted, but untamed lands, untamed wildernesses. Um, the, the human kingdom spans an almost Pangea-sized continent, with plenty of cities and towns dotted throughout. Um, uh, I gotta double-check the population charting I did. Um, but it, it, it's it's several million people. It's not nothing to snuff at, but you know they're spread across all of Europe essentially. So, um, so it's a lot of smaller towns or bigger cities spread very far away. So travel between bigger cities is usually pretty dangerous and hectic, and your chances are you're going to go through a dangerous forest with a dangerous chimera, or even sometimes. Smaller villages get overrun by dangerous chimera. Mm -hmm. And I'm guess I'm guessing I'm guessing chimera is a a, chim a chimera or even a chimera class um, monster would be would be one of the major threats in a um, campaign. Definitely. Yeah, um, that or its other monster girls or humans. You know, PC, you know, NPC type characters. Uh, but yeah, lots, lots of Chimera are lots of big threats. Um, there's a really, uh, really great campaign or mini campaign I like to kind of run where, um, you know, what's called Seekers, their type of uh, Chimera that can see the future, descend upon a town and they're considered an omen of uh, bad luck or an omen of disaster. And so, you know, obviously the town wants them gone because they don't want all these, you know, mythic birds to destroy their town. And it because they can see the future, it turns out that there's, like, a big, high, you know, red class, high, you know, chimera class, massive class chimera that's kind of taken all the globinoids, which is our version of goblins and orcs and trolls and stuff, mm -hmm. um, right. which is another type of chimera, but they're intelligent chimera has kind of taken them control and they're about to destroy them. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of fun and you gotta go fight this giant, massive 
what's called an Aster's Chimera, which, while it's not the, the, the end-all, be-all Chimera, it, it is a Chimera for fighting at, like, level 5 or 6 with a party of 4. Um, it is definitely tpk a couple uh, mm-hmm. unprepared people. Yeah. Now... You meant now in the core book that you sent me, there were a ha- there were a handful of nations that that are me- that are mentioned, and I'd like to I'd like to go over them. Just what's what sort of government they have, what that what their general status is, and how how they how they look upon some of their neighbors if there is some tensions. And I'd like to start with the kingdom of Astoria. Human supremacists, largest, most powerful country, they don't recognize the sovereignty of anyone else. Because, screw you, we're God's cho- chosen people. Mm-hmm. Like, when you say that the whole that whole thing of, screw you, we're God's chosen people, are they like a papal state? No, they are not a papal state, though they are highly influenced by the, the religion um, you know, by the, the Church of Aquarius, they've dug their 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 political claws in deep into the Kingdom of Astoria. Um, they're more closely set up like the Roman Empire. There is a royal family instead of a specific emperor uh, with a king. Mm-hmm. Um, but they've got a um, like a whole Senate system set up, and um, Would you, you know, and a whole nobility. So it's this nice mix of like European nobility and kind of Roman... Would you say it's a constitutional monarchy? No. (laughs) Because, uh... Uh... Yeah, constitutional monarchy, you know, that that means rights reign supreme, but the the will of the Senate and the will of the nobles kind of reigns on that. Mm -hmm. Um, the... So next would be... they're almost a constitution. Yeah. So next would be the um, Althabian Kingdom. That's the Snake People, so that's the Lamia. Um, lore-wise, there was a group of five Demifana who were knighted as dames due to great deeds they did during a big war against the Slimes and the Mimics. And uh, Kadia, who was the Lamia for that one, she was she married like the seventh son of the current king at the time, or something like that. I can't remember which son it was. Um, and was given what was desert land because this is useless land to us. Mm-hmm. Screw you, you filthy uh, demi humans. Um, and built her own kingdom from the ground up for the Lamia and the lizard people. They are mostly an export-based economy. They are all, they are a, a full constitutional monarchy there, um, and they have a export-based economy based mm-hmm. on silicate glass and glazes and pottery glazes because the desert's a high silicate sand desert. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, they're very big on art and technology and free thinking and that. Mm-hmm. Uh. Next would be the Kant Empire. Oh boy, oh boy. You want that one? Because I know you love uh, your spider people. Listen, alright. So, uh, just for for instance, uh, all these kingdoms are more or less uh, originally based on these uh, original uh, six dames, right? So, this one, similar story, uh, are based upon the Arachne or the Driders or the Spider People. Uh, and she, the Kant Empire is named after their hero, Kant. Uh, so once she got um, her quote-unquote damehood, uh, she rejected the notion of uh, accepting, you know, the humans, you know, quote-unquote generosity or you know, love because they don't like oh, her like yeah. at all. She, she doesn't. She doesn't. You know, she didn't. She didn't want any of that bullshit. Uh, so she decided to take upon a nation of her own. Says, "Hey, I don't need you guys." I'll just basically start my own kingdom with blackjack and hookers, and that she did. Uh, she would get all of the tribes of Arachne people, went to a forest and uh, locked it down uh, with spider webs, traps, because you know spiders are great hunters and very versatile. They can pretty much do almost anything except fl- well, no, they can fly too. Anyway, but point being, uh, once they got settled down, anyone who tried to attack them. Unless they burn the forest down, they don't get far, and they got you know 
that smart so they know what to look for if they go on trying and actually attack the forest. Um, they once they got settled down, they started to be more uh, open to primarily other monster girl uh, or demi fauna uh, societies. They export them silks and uh, any mercenary work they can, you know, because they were traditionally a tribal and warrior people. Um, and they mostly run or a uh, kind of like a mong. Uh, uh, don't want to say mongrel, but uh, more of a con uh, leader. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm get, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, given that there's there's probably there's probably some there's probably some similarities to the to um to the to the uh, Mongolians since you mentioned since you mentioned a Khan, um, so would it would it be a case of a um. Not a, less of a unified, less of a unified nation at first, but more of a cl- more of a massive collection of tribes. They are a massive collection of tribes. Yes, they all listen to their the quote unquote hero, the dame, uh, because she is the one who brought them together. But if she dies, who knows what happens then? All right. Next would be the harpy homeland, Tepeti. Oh boy, want to sell now? Sure. Um, so, yeah, it's the island of the Harpies. Uh, long story short, um, the Harpies back during the war of dethronement, uh, you know, the big war against the gods Aquarius uh, that reshaped the land, um, the Harpies were very split as to whether or not they'd help or not, so half of them joined the war, half of them didn't. Um, the half that didn't stayed on the Tepeti Isles, and... Um, you know, stayed out of the war. Eventually, they befriended Demi uh, Planar, um, called Quetzalcoatl, um, who was a Demi Planar based around wind, and he eventually became the aspect of wind, which is like being a you know, an actual demi god of of a thing. Um, it's as close to actual godhood a Demi Planar can get, um, and they just kind of are a very reclusive territorial. Uh, people way off in the middle of nowhere, guarded by big, intense storms that make all the ships crash. Um, so generally, they have two things which happen. Um, one, sailors, shipwrecked sailors, make their way ashore and essentially just get trapped there for the rest of their lives and become someone's husband, uh, voluntarily or involuntarily. I couldn't tell you. Um, and then others will go off on a journey of, you know, adulthood and. Um, you know, find a mate and come back. And that's how they just kind of keep themselves populated. Uh, but they're pretty much exclusive. Like, they're very isolationist. They're um, very much inspired by Mesoamerican culture. Uh, a lot of fishing, a lot of grains, a um, lot of mountain. A uh, lot of lot of worshipping a god who lives in a volcano. <laughs> mm-hmm. So next would be the United Federation of Isles. That one is a collection of city-states who have banded together to become an actual, legitimate um, you know, mercantile force, so to say. Mm-hmm. So they are the, each city-state in the in the Federation of Isles is a separate, unique city-state entity, and they all of the the mayors of each town, the elected officials, however they get elected in each city, uh, band together, uh, come together for you know a great big meeting. Um, and they're, they're the merchants. They're the merchant faction, for, this, for the lack of better terms. Um, they're kind of Caribbean in a lot of that. There's a lot of people who live on land and a lot of people who live underwater. And um, they, they deal a lot of your maritime trade. Uh, they deal with a lot of goods going north and south. And uh, it's where a lot of, a lot of sailors... Uh, Go for vacation, so to say. And I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing they'd, I'm guessing they would have the largest amount of, amount of um ship, amount of ships under under their control. Merchant ships, probably they they most likely have the most uh under their under their banner in terms of 
naval might. Um, that's probably still the Kingdom of Astoria because there are they, have, they they tend to have a pretty big focus on military might. Um, so uh, they're less about having a standing military and more about screw with us in your economy tax. Um, so prob- they do have the highest military <laughs> the military might they- of controlling your economy. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm I'm guessing I'm guessing that they that they tend that they tend to le- that government wise they lean more towards a pure democracy. Yeah, they are pretty much a pure democracy. Um, actually, technically, technically, they would be a constitutional republic or a constitutional democracy because. No merchant's going to band together unless there's a guarantee that you're not going to steal his money on fair trade. But they're what, probably closest to a modern day proceeding. And for whatever reason, when I when you were describing them, I ended up thinking of the of the concept of the United States of Austria Hungary that Franz Ferdinand wanted to enact. Yeah. Yeah, there's a yeah, probably. And probably, probably would have, uh, probably would have done that if he hadn't gotten assassinated. Oh boy! Oh boy! So, what, Zan, what I'm hearing is the the the, the big leader of the United Federation of the Isles uh, needs to be a friend for the main thing. <laughs> no, no, that is a terrible idea. Oh, what? Hold on a second. It's breaking up. It's a great idea. Here. I got you, Mildred. <laughs> Um, anyway, next would be the Arthron Empire. Ah, yes, yeah. the Arthron Empire. Yeah, you want that one, Zon? Yep. All right, so the Arthrons, uh, they're the collection of the insect races that were uh, mostly hive creatures. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, bees, you know, ants, termites, whatever, what have you. And they got separated during the... Uh, War they from it, so that kind of like this own little island separate of the main staple of that story. Now with them, since they were highly organized, even with the different types of monsters around, uh, with them a massive amounts of might, it's very uh, communistic in a way. But they still have some type of freedom because they are not only bugs anymore; they're now quote unquote human, or part god, rather, mm-hmm. um, uh, from Zaquarius, giving them intelligence. So they're mostly based on a <laughs> a revolving door queen. Um, the reason why it's revolving, <laughs> the reason why it's revolving is because anyone can uh, be the queen. They just need to challenge her to rifle combat. And in doing so, uh, once they are uh, taken out, the one goes in, and about the end of the day, they can enact any sort of laws or whatever she so wishes because it's just so organized. The only thing that's more constant is the the, the probably a council of like silkworms that act as the advisors that no one kills. And technically speaking, they're probably the ones actually running the country. Um, but the queens can enact any rule until she is challenged again. <laughs> and her, her might is only as equal to about how long she lives until she's killed in honorable combat, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. And their society is a big threat, uh, and it's only held back by one: the queen keeps dying, so their rules can change at any time. Uh, two: they're landlocked; uh, they can try to fly across the the ocean, but most of them won't survive the journey. And their main source of uh, building ships comes from, actually from a country up north because they used all their uh, material on land they are currently on to build what they have now. Mm-hmm. So they go north every time it's summer to uh, not only get men uh, from the, the probably the next uh, kingdom you're probably going to uh, bring up, uh, but to get lumber. So they're at constant war. <laughs> <coughs> Since you mentioned hive mind, that bring that brings me to s- the question that I have is how um, how hive is this hive mind? Is it a case where 
where um there's ve there's very little individuality or is it a case of a sh a um shared consciousness very little individuality yeah and very little uh cuz they have a space where they have their own little you know closet room to be in they can decorate it with whatever they so wish and but as soon as they die it gets repurposed for someone else Mm -hmm. and whatever purpose goes back into the hive. Oh, they also have slaves, uh, but we're going to ignore that fact. Um, so they have little... <laughs> <laughs> just human slaves, who cares? Yeah, they're just human slaves, don't worry about that. Uh, but yeah, they are human slaves who act as quote-unquote breeding stock, and also they would breed others, humans with humans, to have more humans. Because uh, they don't give a crap about <laughs> the current laws, they're going to survive whatever way they so choose. Uh, but that can lead to some uh, dis disagreements between queens. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have in the lore that one queen actually said, hey, we're going to release all the humans. And she got assassinated the, <laughs> two hours later. And the next queen said, we're going to capture all the humans again. And, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, lore-wise, if you really want to get into some of the nitty-gritties, there's a lot of really cool lore around, like, the queens and the changes and things that happened. Um, there was, I forget her name, but there was this bumblebee queen who just looked like this absolute, like, you know, super duper, like, everyone kind of, you know, thought she was a big pushover muffin, but, like, was a berserker uh, type person, uh, type fighter. Just absolutely gnarly, just, you know, the fighter that would just wreck everyone. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, she got killed by this ladybug who was the one who didn't like slavery. And then two hours later, that baby bug got killed. But the 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 bumblebee, it used to be that you could just anytime you wanted to go challenge the people, and that bumblebee got so freaking sick of it uh, because she was being challenged every hour, every minute of every day because no one took her seriously enough, despite the fact that she kept mollywhopping everyone. Um, you know, she enacted a law that there's only a certain day you can challenge the queen. Now. And that's been an effect because it's been a, a, a lot more efficient. <laughs> yeah, and when it comes to this whole anybody can anybody can challenge, um, what I'm kind of reminded of is the is the paradox of the of of the emperor's most holy inquisition in Warhammer 40k. Any in, any inquisitor has near unlimited power, but. The thing that keeps that the thing that keeps them in check is abusing that power might get the attention of another inquisitor who might who ha, who has just as much power to declare them a heretic. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, so with that with that in with that in mind, um, since you brought it up earlier, I will ask about the Isvirki Republic. I'm hoping I pronounced that right. Actually, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you want it then, or shall I? Yeah, I'll take it. All right, so the Israeli Republic came from the uh, original idea of uh, what about the people who uh, want to be friends with the, the demi-fog? What about the furries who the like the furries? <laughs> what about the degenerates who belong on the cross? Anyway, so... <laughs> During the subjugation wars, obviously, uh, humans at first, all for it, uh, well, not for it, because they were trying to subjugate the humans, but they was all for, you know, taking it to the demifauna. And when they uh, beat them and took them as, you know, ironically slaves again, uh, those who are now in the Republic become second-class citizens. And now it's been a couple of years, people started getting more and more attached to their, you know, demifauna. Uh, servants at this point in time, anyway. Some of them um, were friends that were just in a mutually re relationship because you might as well be my slave and appreciate you, right? Yeah, and it's just, everyone has different types of feelings on it. Uh, some servants, some are friends that turn servants, stuff like that. And uh, those who you know had these ideas uh, had to get away from the uh, kingdom of Astoria because they wasn't having any of that. <laughs> So they, they fled, uh, very dangerous, lost many people, but eventually came to the north where they're far enough away from the uh, Astorian Republic, uh, Astorian Republic, the Astorian uh, government, the church, mm -hmm. and started building life for themselves. And eventually the you know, word gets out that, hey, uh, if I don't want to get prosecuted by, you know, 
humanity or even other demifauna for you know fr fraternizing with humans i go here and using their combined uh talents they're able to you know set up a nice society and hence the name the republic uh they're very hardy very you know uh, Norse inspired mm -hmm. and their main challenge uh, comes from like I said the aforementioned uh, empire because uh, they keep stealing their guys <laughs> they kind of need those mm -hmm. and also their lumber uh, every summer yeah and I'm get I'm I'm get I'm guessing be I'm guessing because of that they they te they pro they probably prior they probably put a lot of priority in ke in keeping keeping cities and villages um as defended as well defended as they can. Yes, uh, as well defended as they can. Walls not only just from uh it, it helps you know deal with the elements because you know it's, it, they're up far north and these are uh at some times magically enhanced storms so they they really gotta you know band together to survive like. It's very uh, communal mm -hmm. uh, for not only just heat, supplies, anything. It's everything shared as much as they can anyway. Um, what would in that regard? What would their leadership be like? Is it a, is it a case of uh, not of a of a loose a loose collection like some of the previous centuries we've talked about, or it or would it be more akin to a um, jarl from from ancient times? It's more akin to a y'all. Mm -hmm. uh, they just have the collection. They don't have the "quote unquote" high king of Skyrim. Uh. No, but it, but it, but it would be a case where you have you have essentially essentially a collection of fiefdoms. Yes. If yeah, you can make it here, it, it, if you can make it here, it's yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a small collection of fiefdoms, but the integrity of the Azurian Republic does consider them kind of one people. So um, there is there is a big kind of almost federal government, and that is I want to say it's nine elected officials. Then I can't remember the number. Um, but, yeah, it's nine elected officials from different walks of life, different of those little bit of fiefdoms or state. Uh, you know, or provinces, if you will, um, uh, representing, you know, uh, the demifauna people, the humans, the this, the that. And so it is it is a small collection of uh, of elected officials. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's less like the, you know, the collection of city-states where they're separate city-states. Uh, they are all under one banner. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And now with now um taking all taking all of that into all that into account um i feel i've we've kind of danced around it but i think this is as good a time as any to discuss the concept of a dame now since it since obviously it's in the title and we did talk about how a lot of people who go out adventuring have have hopes to become one themselves I think this is as good a time as any to discuss what exactly a dame is and why it's so important in this setting. Yeah. Um, so a dame is quite literally a dame, as the word would suggest. It is a female knight. Um, the the viewpoint, the the understanding is that. Um, you know, it, again, it's based off of the, the, the six great dames from the Slime Mimic War. They all achieved knighthood. They were essentially knighted by the king of Nestoria. They achieved such great feats as adventurers and got such fame and renown and then were substantially knighted that their feats actually created socio-political changes in the society. Uh, not necessarily super major, but it, it kind of helped turn a lot of demifauna from slave into either serfs, which is not that much better, but still an improvement because they can all, you know, they, they, they have some self identity now and some self ownership or some form of free citizen. And now, because of the, the popping up of these different, you know, like the, the Lamia kingdom of Athaban and, and this, that, the other thing, there are now more communities 
And it also led to actually the banning of slavery in the kingdom of Astoria. It is now illegal to own slaves. Not that that's enforced, by the way. Uh, but you know, there has been significant social change. So the hope of any demifauna becoming an adventurer is to become an adventurer of such renown and prestige that one, you don't have any trouble finding a mate, you know, because you're a sexy, successful adventurer, and so obviously all the human men are going to throw themselves at you. Um, and um, two, you bring about a better life for your people. Mm -hmm. Because we have six main races, uh, the, 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 the Arachne, the, the Lamia, the Harpies, uh, the, the dog people slash cat people, and uh, the centaurs, and that's all, they're, they're, they're the more dominant races, the more well-known races, uh, as well as the mer people. They're the, they're the more kind of prominent races because of the feats of the adventurers who are representing them. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, and with ev with everything we've gone in we've gone into, um, I know that I know that it's current. I know that you guys are 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 working at it and plugging along. But what are you guys shooting for as far as a release window for the for the project? August. You guys, are, you guys are shooting August of this year, or August of twenty twenty three. 2022 August is our hope. Um, currently, in terms of book stuff that needs to be get done, um, Zen and I need to just finalize some of the lore stuff that's going to go on the book, just making sure verbiage and that's all correct. So um, I, I need to look over that with him, uh, hopefully this weekend. Um, and um, I think we just are finalizing the uh, destinies. Other than that, I'm just waiting on um, and so I'm hoping to, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, to get a uh, book sent out to the printer in mid-July. Um, and we start shipping out books to our backers sometime in August, probably late August. Right. Well, we've been saying August, so late August is still August. I don't care what you say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. Hang on. Thank you. And yeah, thank you. With that said, I would like to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedules to come onto the show here and enjoy the madness that always happens. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having us on. It's been a blast. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.